All right. Well, it looks like it's 932, so we're going to get started. Um, so I just wanted to start first off and just say thank you so much for taking the time to join me and be here today. My name is Dave Gerhart, and uh, my background is I've got a music education undergrad. My master's is in conducting, and my doctorate is in percussion performance. And I love teaching non-education or non-percussionist educators how to help improve their percussionists. Um, when I was teaching at a university, I, I never let a grad student teach percussion methods because I always thought it was so important to make sure that the educators that were in the class um, knew how to teach percussion. So I always taught percussion methods and that was one of my favorite classes ever. Although trying to teach percussion methods in one semester is always crazy. So that's why I think, you know, as non-percussionist educators, um, you know, we learn how to play a wind instrument and we take maybe two semesters of, of doing or two or three semesters of a wind instrument or a brass instrument. And there's a lot of concepts that overlap in percussion. There's just so, so many different things that we have to learn that it's so hard to pack them into one semester. So the goal of this webinar today is to talk about um, <clears throat> beginning snare drum. And uh, we're going to talk about three things in particular. So the first thing we're going to talk about is adjusting the height of the snare drum, making sure that you have the perfect height and how you teach someone to do that. The second thing that we're going to talk about is the grip. We're going to talk about match grip and how to teach someone how to do match grip. And the third thing that we're going to talk about is um, learning different strokes, not rudiments, but the different strokes that we need to play on the drum. So I'm going to grab some sticks and I'm going to move back here. Um, so I've got a pad that we're going to use later for playing and a drum. So the first thing we're going to talk about today is how we set the height of a snare drum. OK, so the first thing you do, so most kids, are gonna just come up and play however they they want and they'll just step up to the drum. And sometimes it'll be too high or sometimes it'll be too low, okay? So when I was learning, uh, the kind of rule of thumb was to set the drum at your belt buckle. And if I were to set the drum at my belt buckle, it's still a little low, it would be here and I would approach the drum up here which as you see with my elbows, I look like my elbows are too far out and I almost look like a chicken, right? I want to play, I want to set the height of the drum so that when I step up to the drum, my arms come and set and be in a good position. And you can see just from that, when I set my arms up, see how much different the height of the snare drum is. So let me back up one thing. If you want to ask a question, in the chat mode, there's a button where it says chat mode. Click that, it'll go to question and answer, it'll mark it as a question, and then I'll be able to answer any questions. If you want to speak, there's a speak button. You can click that. You'll just have to set up your headphones and your video if you want to do that. We can interact, but let's just, uh, we'll keep going. If you have questions, do that. I'm going to teach kind of each section, and then I'll come up to the computer and answer any of your questions. So if I were to, do this, and what you have to do is do it away from a drum. You don't want the height of a drum to influence where your arms are. You want to tell the drum where it's going to be set. So you've just, <clears throat> if your arms are at your side, and what I think about is my nail, my thumbnail, touches the seam, the outside seam of my pants, right? And I'm just going to come up and let the sticks fall. And you'll notice, and I'll do it from the side as well, you'll notice that I'm doing this from my elbow. I'm not bringing my arms up. I'm just pivoting from my elbow up and I'm just letting it set naturally. Now you'll notice that if you're doing it correctly, there's a downward slope to this. It's not going to be here because then that's going to be too high. You're just going to want to have a downward slope, okay? And the other thing that you'll notice is that everyone's got a distance between their elbow and their body, and everyone's body is different, obviously. So as we have that difference between our body, that stays when I'm playing. You don't want this, and you don't want this, right? You see a lot of kids that kind of force it in. You just want to be 
natural. Everything is relaxed here. I'm not bringing up my elbows. I'm just like if I were walking down the street and I were to pick my hands up, there's my playing position. I'm going to do it from this angle so you can see that. Okay. So now I set the height of the drum to that position. So I step back from the drum, I bring my hands up, and there's my playing position. Okay. Now I got the height of the drum. The next thing that you want to make sure is that the snares are perpendicular to the player. So you see these snares on here, right? You want those to be perpendicular to the player on the, on the stand. And you want what's called the throw off, which is the mechanism that turns on and off the snare drum in front of you. You want to play always over the snares. That will give you the most snare response. So always perpendicular and the throw off is on this side. And this side is what we call the butt side. So the butt side is always opposite of you. And you know, obviously you say that in middle school and you're gonna get all, everyone laugh. But um, so throw off here and there. Now you'll also notice, I angle my drum a little bit away from me. There are two schools of thought here and you can decide what you're going to do. I angle it away from me because of that same concept. When I pick my hands up, I have a little bit of downward slope, okay? If you were to do it flat, you would not adjust it in your arms, you would adjust it with your wrist and bring your wrist up a little bit. That is totally fine. There are two schools of thought, both are, both are right. So you just have to decide which one you're going to do. So I like to do it at this so that I have a more natural, once I come up here, I'm limiting a little bit of my wrist stroke. So I'm not gonna be able to come up as much. It's not bad, it's not good, it's just different, okay? So you decide and then just make sure that your students are always doing that. Now with the different heights students, you're going to, every time someone gets to the snare drum, they're going to have to adjust it, okay? The other thing that I would recommend highly is when they are adjusting the height, and I don't, you can't see it really on the video, so I'll pick it up hold the basket don't hold the pole because what's going to happen is the drum is heavy when you loosen this when a kid holds the pole they're going to pinch their fingers okay so always make sure that you're and i always do it with my weak hand my left hand is on the basket of the snare and then i adjust here and i can have the different height right okay obviously on the ground all right so that is setting up the height Let's see if we have any questions. All right. Um, Shelly, elementary van, middle school. Uh, what kind of sticks and size sticks should I recommend? I'm going to go over that in a second. Any other questions? I think that's the only question. Perfect. Okay. So everything else is clear as far as the height and setting up. So as you're doing it, every time that you come up to a drum, the kids have to adjust it. So if you're on a concert, and you've got you know one kid playing snare drum on the first piece and the next kid is coming over they, they have to have time to adjust that and there's usually plenty of time it doesn't take take long but you have to instill in the students that they have to adjust and make sure that they are at the proper height for that okay so sticks since we're talking about how to form the proper grip there are tons of sticks and i'm going to recommend um four different sticks um there are, let me back up so you can see me. Um, the one thing that you don't want to do is you don't want to use a drum set stick in a concert band setting. And it, it's hard to do this on a video and hear the difference, but a concert band stick means that it's a bigger bead. So that's the bead of the stick and a bigger shaft and a bigger stick. So what that will give you is it will give you more fundamental in the sound and give you a better tone, okay? A drum set stick is generally a smaller tip and a smaller shaft and body of the stick. And that's more for playing, moving around. When I'm playing snare drum, I'm playing on one surface. So I'm gonna use a bigger stick. So I'm gonna give you some recommendations. So this is, and I, after the fact, I will uh, be posting this video on my website and I'll put recommendations to all these. So this is a Promark Concert One stick. This is a good stick. 
Um, Vic Firth also has the Symphonic Collection. It's a persimmon stick, so a, a bigger bead to it and a bigger shaft to it. It's not a marching stick, it's a concert stick, okay? And then Innovative Percussion. This is uh, I, the IP1 is their, their top selling concert snare drum stick. Uh, this was a, a 25th anniversary version of it that you can't get anymore. It was like a laminated stick, but the, they do sell the IP1. And <clears throat> again, a bigger shaft, a heavier stick and a, a bigger bead. And every stick, just like everything else, you know, like there's the different beads. You may not be able to tell. They're a little bit different in size. The Promark ones are even bigger. So Promark also has a concert one and concert two stick. I'll link to all these in the in the um, in on the website. They're all great, great sticks. Okay. So as far as um, how you hold the stick, now I always recommend, and I'm coming off to my table. I'm always recommend getting a pad for your classroom that has a real drum head on it. And the reason being is there are there are many pads, just like every other music accessory, there's way too many of everything, right? Um, but there's pads that are rubber, there's pads that have a have a head on it, there's pads that are made out of mouse pads. You know, this is just a mouse pad or some similar to a mouse pad. Um, and we'll talk about that in a second. But I always recommend a drum head practice pad um, and there are any any pad that simulates a drum and the reason I don't say for a beginner to get a rubber pad is because how many rubber drums do we have not very many right so it's uh, it's a, a, a surface that really gives you a false sense of the feel so when you have a rubber pad it's gonna make your sticks bounce and then you're gonna roll super easy and then you're gonna get to a drum and it's gonna be bad so make sure that you get some kind of um, practice pad that has a, a drum head. And what I really, really prefer are this, uh, and I'll try and put it, it's a Remo Silent Stroke practice pad. Now Remo, you know, makes tons of drum heads. Um, but the cool thing about this is it's a mesh head. So listen to the difference. Here's a practice pad and you may not be able to tell huge difference but here's a practice pad of the drum here's the silent stroke way softer so this is something that you could use in your classroom this is something that you know when you're doing warm-ups uh with doing long tones with the band the kids could be in the back corner or they could be in an uh in a practice room practicing and and working on the rudiments on this softer pad and you're not going to hear them which is great the other thing that Remo makes is, so this is just a, this is a drum, and I just put a mesh head on the drum. So if you've got some old drums that are laying around, um, this is a piccolo snare drum that I that I don't use very often. So I just put a mesh pad on it, and I can practice. I mean, I I practice with this pad when I'm on the road in a hotel. I practice when my kids go to sleep, and they don't hear me at all. It's very soft. Um, and it gives you the sense of a uh, 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 rebound, just like a pad, okay? So we're gonna start with our, I'm gonna turn to the right so you can see me. We're gonna start with our dominant hand, okay? And I always talk dominant hand, non-dominant hand, or weak hand, okay? When you're in a classroom, you, you know, we live in this right-hand world. If you're a lefty and you're trying to play, you know, you have this sense of uh, which hand are we using? So I would use dominant hand and weak hand. So my dominant hand for me is my right hand. And the way that I'm going to teach someone how to hold the stick is you are trying to find on the stick a fulcrum, okay? So you take your first finger and this is the percussion first finger. It's not piano one, it's the, so I always call it the first finger. So I take it and I put it somewhere you know, maybe like 40% from the butt end of the stick and 60 from the tip of the stick. And I just let the stick fall on a pad. And I count how many bounces. So that was about six, seven bounces. Okay. And then I start moving. So I'm going to move back. 
four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Now I'm getting about 10 or 11. Keep moving back. Still okay, maybe dying a little bit more. I'm gonna come off the stick and see what that happens. See how it just dies into the pad. Okay, and then I'm gonna go the other way. So maybe like 50-50 and try it. Oh, you can't do it. So that's good for the students to know as well, that if you hold it about 50-50, the weight is such on the stick that it won't bounce. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to find on the stick the point where I get the most amount of bounces. Now this is going to be different for whatever stick you have or whatever your size hand is, okay? It is generally a general one third from the butt end from the back of the stick and two thirds from the, the tip of the stick. So for me on this stick, it's about there. So once you find that, especially in a middle school or a beginner situation, you get a Sharpie, okay? And I'm just going to, so I've got that one, two, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 11. I've got that point where I, where I know that I'm getting the most bounces. I'm going to, as a teacher, draw a circle around the stick. Oh, that was not a very good circle, but it will do. I need to do uh, more drawing with Mo Willems and make sure I get a better circle. All right, so I've got that circle, as you can see. Now, why put that circle? Well, for the student, it's perfect because then they know every time that they grab the stick, that's where I'm going to grab the stick, okay? For the teacher, it's also great because you can see, you know, if they're holding the stick back here and you see the line, you know that Johnny's not holding their stick correctly, okay? So right on that, okay. Now, and generally when they have that point, there's going to be, again, depending on the size of their hand, there's going to be about an inch sticking out of the back of the stick. See that, okay. So now that I've found that fulcrum or pivot point, so you can decide what term, you know, if you wanna turn this into a math uh, uh, lesson, you can talk about the fulcrum and on a seesaw where you have that fulcrum. So I have that fulcrum. Now, I'm going to talk about match grip today. And the reason I'm going to talk about match grip for concert playing and for beginners is because it's the grip that we use for everything. If I go to vibraphone, I'm going to play match grip. If I go to marimba, I'm going to play match grip. If I go to bells, if I go to timpani, if I go to anything, 99% of the, the things that we're going to do in a concert setting are based on match grip. Now I'm not saying that traditional grip is bad, it's just more of a marching grip, okay? So I wouldn't teach a beginner match grip because you're using this left hand, your weak hand to try and do this motion. And for a beginner, it's easier to teach them both with match grip and then they can evolve into, once they get their, their chops together, they can evolve into a match grip. Sorry, a traditional grip. All right, so I've got my strong hand, got the mark on my stick, and I'm letting it bounce. Okay, so in that first knuckle, that first knuckle of my first finger, the stick sets in that first knuckle. Okay, and then my thumb goes opposite. Let's see how I can. It goes opposite of that, okay? You'll notice that my thumb is parallel to the stick, okay? And my first knuckle of my first finger has the stick on that side, okay? And I always think, you know, you can decide how you want to do this. Um, if I were to drill a, um, a nail through here or a, a screw, it would go through the stick, and out the other side, and that would be where the stick is pivoting from, okay? That's where I have the most control. And if you don't have a good fulcrum, or if the student isn't careful about creating a good fulcrum, it's going to be harder to roll. And as we know, rolls are the hardest thing that you have to teach and also have to play, especially for a young kid. We've, we've all heard this, right? So fulcrum there. Now, the other fingers, well, actually, before I go to the other fingers, the stick, as it goes out of the back of your hand, contacts the love line. So the love line is the one that goes out of your hand. 
not the other one, okay, out of your hand. So I put that contacting the stick, and then my other fingers wrap around the stick. They don't hold it and turn tight. They just wrap around. I had a really good analogy that if you if you had like a little bird and you had it in your hand, you wouldn't want to kill it. You would just let it so that it could, you would still be holding it, but it wouldn't get away, okay? So those other fingers are on the stick, but they're not compressing. And you can tell if someone is holding the stick incorrectly other than this is if their fingernail, let's go this way, if their fingernail turns white. That's putting way too much pressure on the stick. You can also see the tension here, right? So just, it's very loose. You should be able to, at any point, come by and pull the stick out of the student's hand. That's how relaxed it needs to be. Not loose, not sloppy, but relaxed. So I just very, okay. So I've got that stick. I do that same thing with the left hand. And this is something that you have to make sure that the students are doing regularly, that you're really reinforcing this and making sure that they're doing this, okay? So I've got my, my grip on both hands. Now, the stroke. <clears throat> Let's see if there's any questions before I go into the stroke. Uh, hey, Marsha, Marsha Neal joined us. Um, not SD1 sticks, Justin asked. Um, I don't prefer the SD1 stick and it's mostly just because of the taper of the stick. Um, we're going to talk about this when we talk about rolls, but the more taper on a stick, the more the stick flexes and the easier it is to roll. Um, the other thing I don't like about the SD1 sticks, and I love, you know, uh, uh, not to bag on any one company, is I think the bead is a little too small. Um, it's a, the, the size of the stick is good, but the bead is a little bit too small, so you don't get as much fundamental out of the drum. So you, it, the bigger the bead, the, the bigger the stick, you get more fundamental. And when you go back to the classroom and you have your drum, you know, get a smaller stick and get a bigger stick and listen to that and listen to the differences. Um, Sarah asked, do the silent stroke heads hold up as well as the other heads? Um, in a school setting, I'm not 100% sure. I believe that they do. Um, <clears throat> I've had this one for about two years and I haven't had a problem with it. Uh, I think they may hold up a little better because they're not going to lose the coating on them like on another drum pad, but I don't 100% know the difference. Um, and Elisa said, you know, the SD1 seems so bulky in the hands of a fifth grader. Um, yes, uh, that is true. But the, the sooner that they can get that, uh, that feeling, I think it will help them down the road because it's really going to be easier to bounce the stick. All right. Those are my questions so far. So let's talk about how we, we've got the grip now. We've got the, let me get two sticks that match here. We've got the, we've marked the stick. We've got this, we're looking at this. And you know, the other thing that I would suggest is have your students check each other because they're going to be the best teachers. Oh, you're not holding it right. You got, make sure, well, make sure that they're doing it constructively, but make sure that they're doing it because if they can teach someone else how to do it, then it's gonna be easier for them to do it. So I've got my stick, I've got my, my form. So when I come up, to, I've got the height of my, my drum set. We already talked about that. Let me go sideways just so you can see. I'll give you my weak hand, my left hand. Okay, so I come up, I've got my height, I come up to the drum pad, I've got my grip. Now, the stroke is created from 99.9% .9 from your wrist, okay? It is not an arm stroke right now. We'll get to that later in a future webinar. It is a wrist stroke, okay? And I always tell the students 99.9% .9 wrist, okay? So you can just go, and I would start with their dominant hand, with their good hand. And just let them play, okay? And what we're really trying to do is it's like dribbling a ball. I always bring, I have a Laker basketball, go Lakers. Um, I always bring a basketball and show them that the stick moves and the wrist moves just like you're playing, like you're dribbling a ball. You don't dribble a ball like this because when you do it, when you receive it back, it would hurt your hand. When you receive it back, you, you move your wrist up. It's the same thing here. You can also use the analogy of a stove. You know, you wouldn't go a hot stove. You wouldn't say, oh, it's hot. You go, ow, it's hot, and you pull it up. So 
put your sticks down and I generally go about a 55, 60 degree angle with my sticks. They are always in a V, always in a V, okay? And I'll just come up a little from the pad. And then what I'm gonna do is rotate up with my right wrist and I'm going to go about, eh, let's say eight inches above the pad. It doesn't matter what you choose as far as the height goes. You just want to be consistent with it and just tell your students, let's start defining our heights. OK, so I start from about eight inches. I drop it and I come back and I match that. Now, a good way to, to teach this in a classroom is have them both bring both sticks up to about eight inches above the pad. And with my dominant hand, I'm going to drop and come back to that point. OK. I'm having to create the rebound out of the pad, okay? Now you'll notice that I'm not doing this and then trying to come back. I'm dropping and coming back to that same height. And that's why I'm using my left hand as the guide, okay? So you do a good exercise for this would be just four quarter notes. And I, I generally play music and let the students play along with the music. So find something that's kind of slow. And we've got that instead of a metronome, a metronome works just as well. Um, and then I do my left hand. And this is gonna be the fun hand, you know. While they're doing this, you're checking everything. You're checking a common tendency is that the thumb is going to come off the stick, okay? They're gonna wanna hold it like a bat or, or something else. So just make sure that their finger, that their fulcrum is good, that they're on that line, that they're perpendicular, Sorry, that they're parallel to the stick um, and that their fingers are wrapped around. And also look at their fingers. Are their fingers turning white because they're pushing so hard that they're just nice and relaxed, okay? So dropping. And then once they can do like four in a row really well, then start alternating. And still, nice and slow. It doesn't have to be fast. Nice and slow. All right, Let's see if there's any questions, and then I just want to do one more thing, and, oh, Marsha, you didn't mark it as a question. Let's see, when do you transition students from the pad to the drum itself? What are you looking for? Um, as soon as they can get off the pad, the better. So, uh, in a classroom setting, that's probably going to only be one snare drum. So, in the beginning, everyone should have a pad, and then we just rotate, you know? You could do it on a timer, you could do it on a song, you could do it on an exercise base, but as soon as they can get on a drum, the better. Um, <clears throat> once, obviously, that they learn, and they could, but they could learn, they could learn all of these different techniques on a drum. It's go always gonna feel a little bit different on a drum than on a pad. So if you can rotate them at an early age, that would be perfect. All right, good, all right. So we have our checklist, number one. Height, putting your arms down at your side, picking up the sticks, coming up to the drum, right? Don't let the drum influence your height. You're going to bring your arms up prior and let it set, come up to the drum, got my grip, everything looks good. And then I'm gonna say, okay, let's bring the sticks up. And you can start defining dynamics with this as well. So you can say, okay, eight inches is going to be my forte. And you can say, okay, today we're gonna to start at a forte level. So they know that's about eight inches. You could say, we're gonna start at a mezzo forte and that's going to be about five inches. These are all, all arbitrary. You, you, can make, you can make up whatever heights you want. You know, the main thing is that you're consistent, okay? So you figure out your heights and your distances. We've got that, we've got our stroke, right? Now, the last part we're going to talk about today, and I, it's 10 o'clock, so I, I want to make sure I respect your guys' time as well, is the different stroke types. There are basically three different stroke types. Some people say four, but we're going to talk about three. And the three are a full stroke. So let me just do one stick. So a full stroke. And basically a full stroke is starting and ending in the same spot. Okay, so I'm doing coming down and back up to do a full stroke. So I teach these three strokes before I teach rudiments because they need to know these strokes in order to do rudiments. And I'll show you what I mean in a minute. So full stroke, starting and ending in the same spot. 
right? If a kid is hitting a lot of rims, like I just hit a rim there, then you're going to want to lower the drum just a little bit, okay? Making sure through all this that they're not bringing their arms up. This is very common. This is very common. This is very common. So remember, it's just as you're walking down the street, you pick up your hands and there's your playing position, okay? So a full stroke is number one. Number two is a downstroke. And what I'm doing with the downstroke is it's starting high, say eight inches for now, and stopping. I'm not letting the stick rebound. I'm just going down. Okay. And then conversely, the last stroke is an upstroke. So I'm starting low, say an inch from the pad, and I'm coming back up. So starting down, up. So I've got full stroke, downstroke, upstroke okay and that is that is something that is very tricky probably for you as well as your students okay so i've got that height i'm coming down and i'm gonna use my left hand as my guide so here's my full stroke here's my down stroke and here's my upstroke okay now my left hand full stroke down stroke upstroke okay those are the three basic strokes that you're going to need to know. The other one that I said sometimes people say four is some people call a tap stroke. So where it starts low and ends low, another stroke. I just call that a small full stroke because it basically is. But sometimes you'll hear people say that there are four different strokes and that's fine. Uh, now, why learn these? So everyone hopefully knows what a flam is, right? A flam is basically just a combination of a downstroke and an upstroke. So my right hand is going to come up, my left hand is going to stay down, and I'm just alternating. So once I learn all of these stroke types, then I can put them into the rudiments and be much more successful about teaching rudiments. Rudiments is, is episode two, so we'll leave it at that point. Uh, I'm going to look and see if there's any questions if anyone wants to speak, uh, but that's basically our session for today. Let's see. Sarah says, can you tell real quickly what type of stand you're using as well? Um, this can wait until later. No, we can go about right now. So um, as far as um, this is just a, a, this comes with, not comes, you can purchase this with a Remo practice pad. This is just a Remo uh, stand. Now you could obviously use a uh, music stand. Music stands work fine as long as the student is, is tall enough, okay? So um, if they're, you know, if they're middle school or elementary school, it may not quite work. You can use a table. All of these pads, all these pads have a, uh, a rubber bottom, so it's not going to hurt the surface of the table. So if you have a table that works, great. Um, you could you could buy mouse pads. I mean, in the beginning, you don't need all of this. You need a pair of sticks and a mouse pad. Now, I know mouse pads are not as popular as they used to be, but you know you can go on Amazon or other places and find um, inexpensive mouse pads, like the Staples mouse pad for two bucks or whatever. Get a, a table, and you've got practice pads um, at home. You know, when you're practicing these things, since we're not doing rolls yet. You could use any surface, you know, if you've got an old piece of wood outside, perfect. Um, if you've got a art book that you had from school, you know, my wife is an art history teacher, so she's got a lot of art books and you could use that. Obviously it's going to dent the, the art book and so that may not be ideal in every situation, but I've got plenty of pads, so that's not an issue for me. Um, so also um, there are different pads. So like I was saying, this is a ProLogic pad it's basically the same material as a mouse pad. This one's really thick, and then this one is a little bit different, a little more rubber. So they have different uh, densities, but really, it doesn't. At this stage, it doesn't really matter. Um, if you have a drum, great, use a drum. If you have a, a, a mouse pad, use a mouse pad. Anything that will work. The sticks are the main thing. Just making sure that your your mechanics are good. All right, we got a couple other questions. Sorry, which sticks are you using right now? Um, well, I had I had four different kinds of sticks. So this is a, a signature stick by Jake Neasley, by Vic Firth. It's a symphonic collection. 
Um, this is a little more advanced. And the reason it's a little more advanced, like I wouldn't start my beginners on this, is you see the stick has a back taper to it. That affects the bounce a little bit. Um, again, it's kind of an advanced thing, so I wouldn't use that. Um, I've been using these lately. Um, I also had the, the Vic First Symphonic Collection. And I'll put links to all these in the, in the um, I'm going to put the video up on my website, percussioneducation.com. Um, IP1 on Innovative. And then I had the Promark Concert One. Oh. The Promark Concert One, where's the, they also make a Concert Two, which is a little bit smaller. Um, so I'll put links to all these on my website. Uh, at percussioneducation.com. Let's see. I've got, um, I use these stands. Samantha says I use these stands too. They're great in various heights of students in middle school. Perfect. Uh, now that we're not going to see our kids for a while, do you have any teaching videos? Yes, I do. And that was my next thing. So I'm going to show you. Um, if you go on, on YouTube and search up percussion education and my last name, there is a link um, to some videos. So let me show you. This was all the stuff that I covered today are in these. So if I do this, I play the video. So here is episode one. And these are some videos I shot about six years ago. Hi, my name is Dave Gerhardt, and welcome to episode one. Hi, Dave Gerhardt. Today we're going to so talk here's, about a no here's a video on episode one, setting up the different height heights of the snare drum. What is correct. And then there are, you know, episode which one is this this is episode two the match grip so if you want to review and go back you can watch this video you can also watch the videos Hello. that i have on there welcome to but these are two good percussion these are videos for your students the other thing i wanted to show you and i'm going to put this um out there so what i wanted to give you guys today for your students are some snare drum warm-ups now um we haven't talked through the whole thing, but if you've got some students that um, can use this, there is a video, episode 21, that goes over each of the different things in the warm up. There's a lot of rudiments in there, and we'll get to that. I'll do a whole video on on how to teach that as well, but um, give you guys that offer. Ah, thanks, Sarah. Put in the uh, playlist to the different videos. Um, and I think I have answered everyone's questions. If I haven't, um, feel free to, uh, you're welcome to email me. Uh, my email address is drdavegearhart at gmail.com. That's also on the Percussion Education website, so you can see it on there. But I really had a great time. Hope this has been helpful to everyone. And, uh, you know, let me know if they have any questions. And thank you so much for joining me today. I'm planning on doing this next Saturday, hopefully uh, continuing this through uh, the coronavirus uh, video series. So thank you so much. Have a great weekend and we will talk soon.